Jason, which is larger, 15 or 60? 60. 60 is larger than 15. Are you sure? I am a qualified mathematics uh, instructor. So why did I get 60 verses and you got 15? Because you're older than me. That's it. But am I, am I four times older than you are? Uh, it's been rumored. Uh-huh. You know what, this is in a minute, that, in a minute this is going to do that weird thing with the font. Thing. Again? Well, it does it after it's been on for just a few minutes. We'll, we'll get through it. Somebody didn't have us prepared, I guess, that today. Is, yeah, that was your job today. No, it's not for my job. Oh. What are we going to talk about tonight? Acts, chapter 6 and 7. How do you know? Because last week we did 4 and 5. That's a good reason. And we're going sequentially through the book. Well, we're not going sequentially through the Bible in, on I Sundays. I didn't say that. We're going sequentially through the book on uh, Wednesday nights. Okay. Yeah. So that means we're going to start with? Acts 6. Is that odd or even? That's even. So that's you. And you're odd. I'm odd. You're even. <laughs> so this, is, this must be yours. This one's mine. So Acts uh, 6, 1 through 4. Where did we leave them off last week? What happened, at, what happened in 4 and 5? That's, that's been so long ago, I don't remember. I know. Anybody remember what happened at the end of 5? Your, Teresa? Your oh, Mine? Yeah, test 1, 2. Oh, yeah. I beg to differ. I heard it. Yeah, I could hear it. Check one, two, test. Had to ump the, ump the volume a little bit. I'm on. Don says I'm on. I'll talk louder. No. 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 You, you got it made. <laughs> I thought Teresa was going to tell us what happened at the end of Acts 5. I thought so too. I um, think it had to do with the apostles and being beaten. And There was in and, Acts 5, there was uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, and then the apostles were arrested and don't do this anymore. And Gamaliel said, hey. Gamaliel said, go ahead. And, yeah, leave them alone. And so they left them alone. Yeah, and so. They they told them. Right in, and you know, back in uh, in chapter four, they had prayed for boldness. They did. They prayed for boldness. And guess yeah. what they got? And they got boldness. And then they got. And then even then, when they were arrested, they were bold, and they kept teaching. And there it is. You said the change the color scheme. We don't want to do that. I don't think they can see that up there. Oh. Okay. Hey, now it's back. Okay, so so all of that to say because at because chapter six begins with now at this time. Yes. Here, so we wanted. To, okay. So so there's stuff going on. It, the, these are not. Sometimes we look at those chapters as being segments of, of like individual things, but they're all related. They're, we're telling a story here. We are, and the numbers are going to become mm -hmm. more geometric because instead of adding, they're going to start multiplying. Multiplying, right? And and. It's interesting to see what causes that multiplication it sometimes, is, it because is. it's not what it's not what modern uh, church growth scholars sometimes tell us would be the thing to make really? churches grow. Really, I am so yeah. surprised. Right, it's not what they tell us most of the time. Yeah. Okay. So verses one through four say, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint rose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food, and the twelve summoned and the and the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, uh, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the number of the disciples was increasing. And it's interesting to see through the book of Acts that when good things happen in the church, like them having things in common and there's miracles taking place and there's healings, growth happens and then even when some negative things happen in the church like the death of ananias and sapphira and and some things like that and beatings and arrests of the disciples and arrests of the the apostles and things like that growth happens mm -hmm. and so the the common thing there is the faithfulness of the of the disciples through each of those periods of of uh of interaction with one another they're faithful when they're interacting in positive ways with one another they're faithful when they're dealing with difficulties and as long as they are faithful and as long as they're doing the things god wants them to do growth is taking place and so we need to not look for gimmicks we need to look for faithfulness exactly when there's faithfulness good things happen it's all it's all internal it's mm -hmm. it's how they deal with things yeah. it's not what happens to them yeah. it's how they they face them right and so here we see an, an interesting thing. You know, it, it makes the point of saying as the church was increasing, as the number was growing, 
then, then there arose a complaint. And, and this is not to be unexpected. We're, we're seeing growing pains. Yeah. You know, even when uh, a, a child's body is growing the way that child's body should grow and everything developmentally is, is growing the way it should, that child can still suffer growing pains. And so um, the church was suffering those growing pains of, of, of a rapid increase in numbers. And now things have grown beyond what we were used to dealing with and, and some problems are coming up because of that. And it's not a flaw in the system, it's just, it's just natural. It's just the that, situation. Yeah, it's just natural that these growing pains would take place. So this complaint arose by the Hellenistic Jews. Now, what is, who are these Jews named Helen? That's the name. I mean, that was the name back then. Yeah, these were, were people of Jewish descent that had taken on the Greek culture. Um, Hellenistic was a, a, a term meaning Greek. Yep. And so they were, um, they were Jews by lineage, but they were Greek by culture. Mm -hmm. And the Jews um, who were Jewish by culture and by nature were the ones that were kind of in charge of things in the, the body in, there in Jerusalem. Um, that's where the church grew, that's where it was born, that's where it took root. And um, so they naturally just kind of looked after one another uh, according to their own culture, according to their own, um, what they were used to facing. But now all of a sudden there's this influx of, of Hellenistic Jews, of, of Greek cultured Jews into the church, and they were feeling left out. They were feeling looked, um, looked over because they were not being dealt with in the same way that the, the Jewish Jews were being taken care of. Um, so the 12, the, the apostles summoned the congregation together and, and acknowledged that the problem was real. They didn't try to you know, sweep it under the rug. They didn't try to say, y'all are being childish, just get over it. Mm -hmm. They acknowledged the problem and said, okay, this is a problem, but it's not a problem that we should um, be distracted by. As the, as the leaders in our position, we need to devote ourselves and keep ourselves devoted to the ministry of the word and to prayer. And so we want you to select seven men that you trust, that are of good reputation, that are full of the spirit, that are full of wisdom, and entrust this work to those men. Let them oversee that work and we will continue doing what we're doing, which is praying and devoting ourselves to the word. And so yeah. there's a, a, a delineation of roles here. Um, it, it's not that this wasn't an important job, not, not that it wasn't necessary, but it, and, it, and it certainly wasn't beneath the apostles for them for this job to be done, but they just had a different role to fill. They had a different set of circumstances they needed to take care of. Sure. Maybe under a different situation, they might have right. done differently, but yeah. in that situation. When, you know, if, if the, the congregation was 50 people, then perhaps that was a job that they would have overseen themselves. Yeah. But now as we've seen that the, the congregation is growing into the thousands. Well, we're probably close to at least to 10,000 yeah. because we had 5,000 men. Mm -hmm. And so the congregation is probably at least around 10,000. That's a pretty good size right. group. And so with, with that much work needing to be done, that was more than, than the apostles could bear themselves. Plus, they had important work to do anyway. Yeah. So, um, so the people, the people like that plan. They agree to it. And so the, the seven men just happened to have Greek names. Well, I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is, why they would choose people with Greek names to take care of the, the complaint by the Greek Jews mm -hmm. just for... Make it right, to do it the right yeah. way. It's transparent, you know. Yeah. We're gonna choose, to make sure that the Hellenistic Jews or women are taking, or widows are taken care of, we're gonna choose seven Hellenistic Jews to take care of it. Right. So, they're pretty, pretty smart. It was a, it was a, uh, it was a wise decision. It was yeah. a wise decision. So verses five and six give us those names uh, and the statement of found approval with the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, He's going to figure importantly here coming up in the next few minutes. And Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, uh, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. And you will be quizzed on those names later. Um, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles. And after praying, they laid their hands on them. So um, the congregation approved. They liked that plan. Again, the apostles met that, met that situation head on. They didn't try to downplay it. They didn't try to... Uh, make excuses for it. They they acknowledged that there was a difficulty there and they needed to take care of it. The congregation appreciated that. They didn't, uh, I, I like that the congregation didn't hang on to the problem. Um, and sometimes we do that, don't we? We, you know, we, we register our complaint and somebody acknowledges our complaint and starts offering solutions, but we're so attached to that complaint that we want to hang on to it 
that we're not willing to listen to, uh, to uh, solutions. We just want the complaint. And I, I like that it, it works from both directions here. The, the uh, apostles acknowledged the difficulty, the congregation accepted the solution. And they worked together to see an end to the, the difficulty. Um, they chose these seven men. Uh, again, and, and they do have, they have Greek names, which is again an acknowledgement of the difficulty. If, if it's the Greek Jews that are having a, um, a complaint, then it makes sense that we would appoint some Greek uh, overseers to make sure that they are being taken care of. Uh, and the apostles prayed and laid hands on them. And the apostles, it, it's interesting what, the, the praying we understand, the laying on of hands is something that is probably foreign to us or yeah. that we don't, that we don't do that we don't practice a whole lot of um, is is this a miraculous laying on of hands these were already it, men that yeah. possessed the spirit Stephen yeah. already it, it even specifically said of Stephen that he, he possessed the spirit but Philip we later we see Philip had the spirit so it could be yeah uh, uh, they may have laid their hands on them that way some other time and this may be a sign of approval you lay hands on right. people to, to commission them and right. it could be either or both okay but Sure. Yeah, it could it, be. It, it could have been a, a, a symbolic laying out of hands, just to, of, of passing on their approval uh, to these men to fill this position and, and do the work that's being assigned to them. Or it could be that the apostles, in their apostolic role of, of being the one who could impart a uh, special uh, special measure of the Holy Spirit, were also doing that in some way as well. Chuck. Right. Yeah. The, the church leaders from Antioch, as they commissioned them yeah. to go on that trip, and, and, it, and they were the ones that were chosen to, to represent the church on that trip, on that missionary journey. Um, yeah, they laid, yeah, they laid hands on him. And, and Saul already by that point was healing people, and, and Barnabas, we know, was a man of the Spirit. So, okay. Probably not. It, that would come in prop through uh, uh, Peter, and then some of the other, uh, the, some of the other. The, you know, they started. It's thing that kind of happened gradually, and some of it was kind of retroactive. But they started having, where one elder would kind of rise to the top in a congregation, and then you'd have one of those elders who would kind of rise to the top in an area, and it eventually was that that Rome was one of the main centers. And of course, there were conflicts for centuries between Rome and, and Constantinople because each one thought they had the, the chief one. But that apostolic uh, succession thing probably comes through for that reason, to, to validify that to uh, uh, Peter and then so forth. Yeah. Uh, but that, that is interesting to point out that uh, uh, you see some of these things that can be kind of twisted a little bit to, to mean something that they don't, they don't mean. Uh, it, it, another interesting thing is that we, we've mentioned that this is called the Acts of the Apostles and it's really a few of the Acts of a couple of the Apostles. And here we have seven men. We know what Stephen did because of the next chapters. We know that Philip went on out and did things. I don't have any reason to think these other guys didn't either. But the Holy Spirit chose Stephen's story and Philip's story to share with us. But I suspect that these other men had, had stories to tell. Sure. Just as all, I'm sure all the Apostles Even did what Jesus told them to do. But we don't know how they did it. Even, even if they never left Jerusalem, they, they still had, I'm, I'm sure, a story to tell about their service in the I'm, church. I'm, and yeah, the I'm sure they, they did. did. I'm sure they did. Um, but Stephen and, and, well, and Stephen didn't leave Jerusalem for what he's about to do, but Philip did. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading. The number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So here... Again, the word of God kept on spreading. We, we just dealt with a, a problem. This is really, from an internal standpoint, this is the first problem that arises within the church mm -hmm. uh, after the inception of the church. There's some external problems for the church of, of facing some external threats that the church grows through. But here's an internal problem. Something arises within the church itself. And even through that difficulty, the church continues to grow. And that's because of the way they dealt with it, because mm -hmm. they acknowledged that there was a difficulty. They, they worked together to correct that difficulty. They trusted in God's 
God's plan for the church um, to be able to see them through that difficulty. And through that difficulty, the church keep the, the word of God keeps on spreading. And so it's, it's an interesting thing that, that through a difficulty within the congregation, the congregation is still out doing the work of evangelism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not a reason to stop evangelizing just because we've had a problem. Yeah. Um, and the number of disciples grew in Jerusalem. And remember the thesis statement of the book of Acts back in Acts chapter uh, 1, I think it's verse 8, that, the, the, um, that Jesus said, You're, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. And so we see that progression taking place. If you, if you just pay attention through the book of Acts, you're going to see that progression. And here it's specifically said that through Jerusalem, the number of disciples is growing. That part of Jesus' prophecy of his statement is being fulfilled uh, up through chapter 6 here. Even to the, the extent that many priests are obe obeying the gospel. Yeah, back in, in John 12, it said that nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Right. And so probably now they've, they've found reason. Some of them have found reason to, to go beyond that. Now they have an They don't want to be put out of the synagogue because that's their congregation. That's their assembly. But now if they're put out of the synagogue, it's okay. They have an assembly. They have to something to. better. They have, they have a, a body of believers that they can be associated with. So um, the loss of their synagogue relationship is not so, so um, devastating yeah. as it would have been before the, the inception of the church. Yeah. Uh, verses 8 through 15 closes out the chapter. It says, Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. And yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, and they came upon him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. And they put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting at the council saw his face like the face of an angel. It says Stephen was full of grace and power. Um, I would like to have met Stephen, um, and, and it, it was something about his character, something about his demeanor, something about the way he comported himself, the way he conducted himself that set him apart from other people. He was noticeably different from other people. He was full of grace and power. Uh, he was performing great wonders and signs. Um, and, and sometimes we think, you know, about a life that's cut short, um, as Stephen's, as we're about to learn, Stephen's will be. Um, we think about, you know, the tragedy of that life cut shorter, the, the tragedy of, of what might have been, you know, the potential that he had uh, to do great things for the church. But he did great things mm -hmm. for the church. And, and his, his was a life that was cut short, but it was cut short for a purpose. It was cut short for the glorification of God and for the furtherance of the church. And it was not a waste. It, it was a tragedy. It is a, a, something to be lamented, but it's, it's not a waste. For 2,000 years, he's, he's done something for the church. Right. It's like the woman who washed Jesus' feet. Yeah. So uh, the, he, he did. He did. We, you know, we, we talk about uh, the apostle James and uh, Peter. James was killed, and Peter was let out of prison. Uh -huh. Stephen was killed, and Philip went on to do other things. Yeah. But they all served the purpose that God wanted them mm -hmm. to do. And in the long run, they all got a great reward. Right. Some just got there quicker than others. Yeah. Yeah, some, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, but these men from the synagogue of the freedmen, uh, and what a misnomer that is. Um, they were, they were um, enslaved to their, to their doctrine, enslaved to their, um, to their beliefs, to the point that they were blinded by the works that Stephen was, was doing. They, they, were they could see the works that he was doing. They could see the miracles he was performing. They were unable to cope with his wisdom. They were unable to answer his arguments. They were unable... Uh, to refute the things that he said, uh, even the things that he said that refuted what they believed, that refuted what they said, but they, in their ignorance, they just continued with their, their plan to discredit him uh, or to try to discredit him. So they secretly induced men to falsely accuse Stephen. They, they hatched a plan. Uh, and we saw that, that type of thing um, tried against Jesus on numerous occasions. And finally, when the time was right, it worked, mm -hmm. not because they succeeded, but because the time was right for Jesus to be sacrificed. And here, you know, some probably 
a, a similar thing. It's not that, that God didn't have the power to um, deliver Stephen. It's not that, that Stephen didn't have the, the power to um, refute their arguments, but the time was right mm -hmm. uh, for Stephen's martyrdom to, to take place. Um, they claimed he committed blasphemy against Moses and against God. They claimed that he spoke against the, the temple um, by saying that Jesus was going to destroy the temple. Um, and, and in these things, they stirred up the people. Stephen was dragged away. He was brought before the council. That's, I mean, all of this is reminiscent of what happened to Jesus mm -hmm. um, uh, in the way that he was treated. False witnesses testified against Stephen, just like Paul, false witnesses testified against Jesus. Um, very similar complaints, even um, saying that Jesus, they, mm -hmm. they complained against Jesus that he said he was going to destroy the temple. And here they're saying Stephen preached that Jesus was going to destroy the temple. You almost wonder if these weren't some of the same men. Yeah, you know, they probably worked were. Once. Yeah, they, they've already got their lines down. Yeah, this this uh, this line of attack worked once for us to get rid of Jesus. Let's use the same line of, of argument to get rid of Stephen. Yeah. Um, and then when Stephen rose to make his defense, the council saw his face like an like an angel. And that voice, that it, you know what, what was it that made his face look like an angel? What was it that that made? I don't know. People notice. I mean, you know, Luke is is telling the story years later but it it was a remarkable enough scene yeah. that people still remembered it and luke as he researched the story heard this part of it that stephen uh, stephen something was special taking place here so um i think you know it makes me think of, of things that jesus said that um that to his disciples that they would stand before kings that they would stand before judges that mm -hmm. they would stand before these things and when the time was right that his spirit would give give them an answer to the things that we're going to say and I think there was a, a calm here for Stephen and, a, and a, a sense of peace that no matter what happened, it was going to be okay. And I think even though Stephen is facing down the, the Supreme Court, the council that, that has within their, their hands his life or his death, it was going to be okay. And by the way, that next last word doesn't have a D on I it. It, 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 looks, like it looks like it does, but it doesn't. I know. And it, was that your typo or mine? That was your typo. Okay, probably so. But uh, I didn't notice it. I didn't notice it until I was trying to say it. So if this is odd, that must be me. That you must be odd now. We are going to begin. Well, they, well, they at Bath. Well, I, I'll jump ahead of verse here. Uh, they say, "Are these things so?" You, you, you're preaching this Jesus is going to tear down the temple and all this stuff. Are these things so? And he said, "Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him." Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God removed him into this country in which you are now living. And he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated. For 400 years and whatever nation to which they shall be in bondage my, I myself will judge said God and after that they will come out and serve me in this place are these things so are you teaching against the law of Moses and he responds to that by giving them a history lesson this is what this is what I know to be true this is what I believe and he just gives them a, a very concise history their own history and he begins with the God of glory and Abraham in Mesopotamia and Ur of the Chaldees. And God said, depart, come into the land that I will show you. They first went to Haran. And then when his father died, then Lot and Sarah and Sarai and Abram went on into the, the promised land. And so God removed him into this country in which you are now living. He had no inheritance. He didn't have a foot of ground. He didn't have a child. God said that I will give this to your children, but there's nothing to give and nobody give it to and yet God made that promise that I will give this to your children. He promised him land as a possession, promised to, uh, to the offspring, that same thing we give to the offspring after him. And he says that there will be aliens in a foreign land. And then he says 400 years. And this is why we may not finish up tonight. Because the way that reads, the punctuation in English makes it sound as if they were 400 years in Egypt, which is not really what it says. It says that they're going to be aliens and slaves and mistreated for 400 years. They were aliens, sojourners, from the time that Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. Right. And so the 400 years is that whole time 
And back in Exodus 12:40, it says, Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. The New American Standard and NIV. But the New American Standard in the side says the time of the sons of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. That's different. doesn't mean they were in Egypt for 430 years. That, that was their time. King James actually says the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And the Septuagint says that's the Greek version of the Old Testament. And that's what they would have used during Jesus' time. And the sojourning of the children of Israel, while they sojourned in the land of Egypt, the land of Canaan, that's how they spelled it, was 430 years. And so they say the time in Canaan and in Egypt was 430 years. Genesis 12, 4 says that Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And so they were in Haran. They left there. He was 75 years old. Genesis 21 tells us that Abram, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And so how many years have passed between 75 and 100? 25. 25. But we need 30 years because it was going to be 430 years and we need to pick up five years. Uh, it begins back when God called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. That was when it, the clock started ticking back then. And there were five years from the time he left Ur to the time he left Haran. Right. And so now we have uh, this length of time. And in fact, this is how, how uh, Paul explains it in Galatians 3, 16 and 17. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Paul dates the beginning of that 430 years to the promise that right. God made to Abraham and 430 years later, then they would go out of Egypt and get the law. And that solves a lot of problems. And we get the idea that they were there 400 years, but they weren't enslaved for 400 years. They were enslaved for about 80. About the time of Moses' birth is when the Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph came along and started trying to, to wipe them out. And so they were actually slaves in Egypt maybe 80 years. And uh, that, that solves a lot of problems. And there's a guy named Belikovsky who many years ago worked on that. Uh, one of the teachers at Sunset, Ted Stewart, has a, has a good book about that. But what happens is, traditionally, if you try to compare the Genesis story and the Exodus story with Egyptian history, it doesn't fit. So they say, well, that's all just made up stuff because it doesn't, doesn't fit. Well, there are a lot of archaeologists who recognize that Egyptian history is about 300 years off because of the way they calculated their calendars. And they, if the Israelites were not in Egypt 400 years, but they were there like 210 years, then things start fitting together. Mm -hmm. And there are no contradictions. And so it's, you know, it's important to understand what they're saying. And it fits perfectly then. Right. with what we know from history. He said, I will judge that nation, the one that, uh, that, that enslaves you. And that's what happened with the, the plagues and then the death of the firstborn. After that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And so God said, after all this time, after their sojourning, uh, then they will come into the land of Canaan, and then they will serve me here. And that's when that will start. He goes right on then to Jacob and Jacob's sons. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. And yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there passed away he and our fathers. And from there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. And so he refers back to that covenant of circumcision that was made with Abraham. Began with Abraham, passed on to Isaac, to Jacob, and then Jacob's 12 sons, the 12 tribes. Joseph was sold into Egypt, but God was with him and raised him to the, to the position of being governor over all Egypt. And then there was a famine. And then he mentions that 75 persons in all 
came. That's another problem. Is there a math teacher in the house? We're doing a lot of ciphering today. Can you read that? I wanted to have them all on the same screen. It may be a little bit small. Genesis 46, 26 and 27. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. But we just read Joseph sent word and invited Jacob and his father and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. So which is it? Yes. Yes. I've learned that from you. You, you learned okay. it. Well, Genesis, uh, Moses says 70 and Acts, Stephen says 75. But if you look closely at Genesis 20, or 46, 26, there are 66 people, not including Jacob or Joseph and his two sons. It specifically says there are 66, not including him. It also says there were 70 not including the wives. You add 66 of those four, then you have the 70, but it doesn't include the wives. There are different explanations from this, but I think the most logical is that Stephen is taking the 66 plus nine wives. Uh, Judah's wife had died and Simeon's wife had died because in his genealogy, the last entry in his, gene his, his descendants is the son of a Canaanite woman. And so apparently his wife had died and Judah's wife had died. So if you take the 66 and add nine wives, what do you end up with? 75. 75. And so how far off was Stephen? He, would, he nailed it. It's all correct. It all fits. Yeah. It's all math. Math is, math is important. It's important that we, we learn our math and we learn our math yeah. well. He gave the covenant of circumcision. We got down to the 75 persons and all. And then Jacob and his fathers passed away and they were taken to Shechem to the tomb that was purchased from the sons of Hamor. And then Stephen moves on to the early life of Moses. He's been accused of preaching Jesus and, and preaching against the law of Moses. And so he's going to start teaching them about the life of Moses. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew, not, knew nothing about Joseph. And it was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as their own son. And Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren and the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday to you. And at this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian where he became the father of two sons. Two, two sons. Uh, another king came along in Egypt who didn't know anything about Joseph and he mistreated the people, started exposing the, the children to kill him and it says at that time Moses was born. And that's why I say that they were slaves for about 80 years. I mean they were already doing slave work but they were oppressed. They were really oppressed mm -hmm. this way for about uh, 80 years. It says Moses was lovely in the sight of God. God just looked at him and said, that is a pretty baby. That is just a beautiful baby. I think that that's why his parents hid him because they saw that he was a beautiful child or something. But have you ever seen a parent look at their child and say, oh, that is one ugly baby. <laughs> so why is Moses lovely in the sight of God? God has not seen any other pretty babies. He, he knew where this was headed. He knew where this was ha headed. In fact, in Numbers 12, it says, now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. When God looked at Moses, what do you think he saw? His physical appearance or who he really was? Yeah. Who, he really was. And who he really was. It was not his physical appearance, what he looked like as a human. It was who he was. Yep. Because he's, he's, he's handsome. 
Yeah, this one. Yeah. Everything like that, you know, and God says no. It's not it's not the one. No, it's not it's not any of those big old guys, it's that ruddy little shepherd boy. Because God saw past who he looked like and to who he was. And so there was another king who didn't know anything about Joseph, and he mistreated the people, but Moses was loved inside of God. He was educated in the learning of the Egyptians, a man of power and words and deeds. Now, I thought Moses said he could not speak. When God sent him at the, at the burning bush, said, I can't talk. He still spoke with power when he did speak. He, he could speak great. I mean, he, he was a good speaker. It was just he a wimpy. Good. He talked good. He... <laughs> He was he was wimping out. He was a yeah. He was a wimp. Well, he was making it about him. Which yeah. Is easy to do because we see our own weaknesses as individuals. But he should have known that he at least had power and words and deeds. He was he was highly highly educated in the training of the, of the learning of the Egyptians. But he wanted to use that as an excuse. God didn't buy it. When he got to be about forty years, he defended that Israelite. But then the next day, when some of them were fighting, he said, "Who made you a ruler and a judge over the us?" We'll get an answer to that question a little bit later. Exactly who made him yeah. a ruler and a judge over them. But right then he fled to Midian and he became the father of two sons. And that leads us up to the calling of Moses. And after another 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. And when Moses saw it, he began to marvel at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, or for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to deliver them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. Then this Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. And so there's the answer to their question. Who made you a ruler and a judge? God did. Yep. And he's the one who, who sent him. And so this Moses, whom they had disowned, uh, is the one that God sent to be their delivery. God had seen the oppression of his people, and he was going to do something about it. And it says that, that Moses is going to be a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel. Mm -hmm. And so the angel was going to help him as he, as he did that. Verses 36 to 44 this man, Moses, led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness, together with the angel who was speaking to him at Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. And our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. And at that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not, me, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of, of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you, which you made to worship them. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. God led them out with signs, or Moses led them out with signs and wonders, and he said, God shall raise up a prophet like me. But just a few chapters ago in Acts, in Acts chapter 3, that second gospel sermon mm -hmm. where Peter said that Moses said the Lord shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him you shall give heed in everything he says to you and he's, he's talking about Jesus mm -hmm. in that context and so he's applying Moses' words then to Jesus he said the fathers were unwilling to be obedient you built that golden calf and you worshipped all those idols the same ones that you had in Egypt and it is always amazing to me how unfaithful the Israelites were yeah. always you know Joshua when he's doing his farewell message says now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord 
And if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are not, that you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That goes clear back to Mesopotamia when Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees, mm -hmm. beyond the river. They were still worshiping those gods. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt where they had been, and they were worshiping the gods of the land that they had gone into. They couldn't get enough gods, mm -hmm. and so they kept adding to them. Amos says, did you present, God speaking through Amos, did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried along Sikath, your, God, your king, and Kaya in your images, the star of your gods which you made for yourselves. In 2 Kings 17, it says, The sons of Israel did things secretly which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. And they set for themselves sacred pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense on all the high places, as the nations did which the Lord had carried away to exile before them. And they did evil things provoking the Lord. When did they even worship God? They were always worshiping idols. He also said that they took with them the tabernacle that was made according to the pattern. And the Hebrew writer says that now if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the, tent, the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And so... God told Moses, you make sure that you do everything according to the, the pattern that you've been shown. And I think we're going to be in Philippians on Sunday. We are. And people are reading Philippians this week. They should be. They have probably read this verse. It says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. God has always been a God of pattern. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't make us guess. He doesn't let us just figure it out on our own. He says, okay, this is... What I want you to do, and this is how I want you to do it. And so God is a God of pattern. Stephen goes on to David. Now, they've, they've said, you teach against Moses, and he just gave him a history lesson in, in Moses. And right. now he's going to go on, keep going to David. And having received it in, in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon the, the tabernacle. Upon dispossession, the nations uh, whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. So the fathers took the tabernacle when they went in with Joshua. Uh, many years later, David found favor in God's sight, and he wanted to make a dwelling place. But we know that story. That, uh, Nathan first told him that was okay, and then God told Nathan that's not okay. And so he moves then on to, to Solomon. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? David wanted to build the, the, the temple, but it was Solomon who built it. But God pointed out, and, and Stephen is agreeing, that God does not dwell in houses made with human hands. And a few chapters later in Acts 17, when Paul is in Athens and speaking to the, the people in Athens, he's going to say the God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And in fact, Solomon said the same thing back in the dedication of the temple. Now, this is Solomon speaking at the de dedication of the temple. He said, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. Pretty much all the cha 66th chapter of Isaiah presents this idea Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. And then it adds, but to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. And so here's God Almighty, the creator of everything. He says, this is what I'm looking for. Hum uh, humility, a contrite spirit, and someone who respects his word. He is we are unable to construct a house that he could live in but he is willing to live in our hearts he will he will he will choose us as his dwelling place if we are humble contrite right. and respect his word uh, you can't build a temple big enough to hold god 
Even if it filled the whole earth, it wouldn't hold God. But he will live in our hearts. That's exactly right. Now we have... <laughs> Everything is okay up Everything's to this okay point. up to here. I think they're probably okay. Where are you going with this? But here we have the action point. This is the action this point. Is, this is the call to action. This is the call to action. <laughs> This is I the call to action. I like the idea of getting stoned after the call to action. <laughs> that, 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 it happens sometimes. If you, if you throw a call to action out there and they don't like it, they'll hit you with stones. Okay. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. They're worshiping all those idols and everything. Mm -hmm. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law is ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. You men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You, all you do is resist the Holy Spirit. Your fathers did it. You did it. They killed the prophets. And you killed the ones, or they killed the ones who were announcing the coming of the righteous one. And you have become betrayers and murderers of that righteous one. You who received the law as ordained by angels. The first few verses of Hebrews chapter 2 says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we just drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also bearing witness with them both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. But notice, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, Paul says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. You received the law as ordained by angels, but you just didn't keep it. You've accused me of dishonoring the law of Moses. Guess what? You're doing it. You're the yeah. ones who aren't keeping it. And then we come to what happens to someone who does that, and that is the stoning of Stephen. Now, we're not going to say Stephen got stoned. You did that Sunday. He got hit with rocks. They threw rocks at him. Yeah, threw rocks at him. Uh, now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Their response was they were cut to the quick. They were actually gnashing their teeth. They were so angry, their teeth were clattering. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed intently into heaven, saw the glory of God. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And the heavens opened up, and he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And so we talked a little bit earlier about the misfortune of Stephen. Can you imagine that experience, getting, being able to do that one thing? That's worth a whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. If we could just have that experience, we should trade anything we have in our life, no matter how long we live. If we could trade it for that, right. uh, we'd be ahead. Because look at what Steve, Stephen got to experience. And then he went right straight there. And so, uh, well, at least to, the, to Abraham's bosom. And so, not a bad deal. Yeah. It wasn't a too bad a trade. They cried out with a loud voice. They, covered, they didn't want to hear anymore. They covered their ears. They went rushing upon him, and they laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. A couple of times later in the book of Acts, as Saul is recounting uh, what he had done earlier, at first he said he gave approval, and then the next passage says that he cast his vote. And so it's not just, he's not just watching the clothes. There's more to it than that. And Saul says he gave approval, and then later he said he cast his vote. Yeah. against him and so he had a had a more important role than just standing by keeping track of the clothes right and Stephen says Lord do not hold this sin against them 
so you see why he has such an incredible spirit yeah. right to the end he, he doesn't say zap him yeah. Yeah, I hope you take care of this well his, his final two statements there are both statements that Jesus made at, at yeah. the cross he, when Jesus said you know into thy hands I commit my spirit and then he also also asked God not to hold the sin against him as they crucified him so so Stephen was not a disciple in word only I no. mean he, he proved it at the end that he was a, a pure follower of Jesus yeah yeah he he knew what Jesus said and he said the same thing yeah and uh, then he fell asleep isn't that a wonderful is that a euphemism for dying yeah that uh, just fell asleep wasn't a bad thing no uh, Peter got let out of the jail but Peter's dead now so uh Philip got to go on and preach, but Philip's dead now. In the bigger scheme of things. If you live long enough, you'll you live, die. Live long enough, you'll die. Well, unless you're Elijah or Elisha or no, Elijah, well, Elijah, Elijah, or Enoch or Elijah. Enoch or Elijah, Enoch or Elijah, or Elijah yeah. yeah. I'm not either one of them. You're not Elijah? No. Enoch? Okie dokie, do they have two minutes to... You I, made it. I am impressed. I, I did not think we were going to make that 60 you verses. You fast. And then all that ciphering we did in there. I yeah, thought, the math that, mathematics. Yeah, the mathematics was gruesome. But uh, we made it. Anybody have any questions? Okay, good. I think we ran out of time. <laughs> time to ask if there's questions, yeah. but no time to answer them. Yeah, well, Chuck hadn't gotten up yet. I'm sure somebody has something to, to comment. No. I was, I was thinking, you know, I, I'd always thought that, that, uh, that about the 400, that they were actually enslaved for that long. I mean, that they were actually being uh, tormented and everything for that long. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought and that out. Uh, that's normal. I, I did too. I, I resisted this idea because I didn't think that was right until I started looking at it. And, uh, you know, and it brings, it brings to me, you know, it's always, always amazed me, you know, that, that uh, Pharaoh would rise up that, that didn't know of Joseph. You know, I mean, I think of our history. I mean, you know, we, we have stories of what George Washington did. And, yeah. It's amazing to it me is. That, that, that he he would not know the history of his people. It it is and it, it, it was it was uh amazing to me that, that Belchazer didn't know anything about Nebuchadnezzar either, his grandfather. I think that they're so egotistical or something, they just didn't care about anybody else. But you, you raise another good question or, or, or remind me of another good question, is that if the Egyptians were only in if the Israelites were only in Egypt 210 years and get to, got to be millions of years. And so Ted calculated using the growth rates in current civilizations. Mm -hmm. And the growth rate to get to that point was less than what, what we experience in the world today in, in yeah. some of the big rapidly increasing countries. And that doesn't take into the fact that God helped them. Right. And so it is entirely feasible that yeah. within 210 years that they could have grown from that number 70 or 75 Yep. two millions it, within that length of time it, it, yeah with with a, a geometric growth pattern it doesn't exactly. ta it doesn't take that much no. it, it, it doesn't it, take that many generations to get from 75 to, to two million no it's, it can be done yeah done quickly and so but it, it does really bring in into connection the pharaohs and the history and Egypt, Egyptian history and, and what the Bible says and so people can't say oh that's that's all made up because there's nothing in, in Egyptian history that doesn't correspond to that yeah. Well, if you adjust Egyptian history and then take into the fact that they weren't there 400 years, then everything just kind of fits in. Yeah. Thank you very much.